Um, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start with just a few comments. I'm Sally Stearns from the uh, University of North Carolina. And the title of this session, it's a special organized session. It's long-term care financing and markets. We're going to have three excellent papers presented. Each um, speaker is going to take about uh, 20, 15 to 20 minutes for their presentation. And then following each speaker, we will have time for questions on that particular presentation. We're hoping to end about uh, 10 or 15, or have all presenters done about 10 or 15 minutes before uh, the end of the full session, as then we can have the three speakers go to the front and have an integrative panel over an, uh, about any cross-cutting uh, cross themes across the three papers. Okay, so thank you very much for being here, and we will just get started. Um, Adelina Comas Herrera. Uh, I work at the London School of Economics at the center that's now called, as of the 1st of July, the Care Policy and Evaluation Center. We used to be called PSSRU, but it was a bit of a mouthful, and after many, many, about 30 years of debate, we came up with a name, which is great. Um, I'm going to give a bit of an introduction to, to long-term care financing, so I won't go into depth into anything but I'll be very happy to take questions about things that are coming up later on. So I'm going to start, because um, we all talk about long-term care, but everybody means different things. But I'm going to start with a bit of with some thinking around when we distinguish and how between healthcare and long-term care, because that's very important when we're thinking of financing. With regards to uh, healthcare, what we know is that most people, almost every member of, of, uh, of every country, uh, is going to need healthcare at some point in their life, probably at birth and for sure probably at the end of their life, unless they have a very particular way of dying. And um, in contrast, with regards to long-term care, it's not something that everybody will experience. And we can, we know from various bit of debate around the numbers, but about one in three people will need long-term care, and it's usually at the end of life, but many people are not going to need it at all. So it's not something that we all experience. Another difference is that healthcare costs are considered a public responsibility. There's a lot of, I'd say, mostly international consensus. There's a few exceptions, and most countries are aiming to provide uh, universal health coverage. In contrast, although long-term care is the result of health problems, it's not something that happens out of nothing, we, we usually finance it differently. And uh, what happens is that there's a sense of unfairness because if you happen to have cancer, you know that most of your care treatment will be covered. But if you have dementia instead, you're going to shoulder a large proportion of the costs that come from what's basically another type of illness. Another and very, very important uh, difference between what we traditionally call healthcare and what we traditionally might call long term care is that healthcare is mostly delivered by highly specialized professionals. Whereas most long term care is actually provided by unpaid carers without training. And uh, there's, um, we know that there's very strong substitution between formal and informal care, and that perhaps is at the key as to why we're financing this. Um, two different types of care differently. I'm just going to make a sort of, the, <laughs> just think, I don't know if you've seen this type of graph before, but this is an estimation of the lifetime cost of care, what any person ca can expect to, uh, to spend on care at age 65. Doesn't include accommodation costs, and this is relatively old now for England. This was done by Fernandez and Forder for the Dilnot Commission in 2011. Uh, so, you, as you can see, um, that works, yes. So, there's a few people who are going to have very, very high cost of care, but there's quite a lot of people who will have none. So, that would, sig that would signal that this is, and this would be the group that we'd call, that might, we might say these people are facing catastrophic cost of care. Um, this is now a bit old, but about 250,000 would be the value of many people's houses which in the UK are used to finance long-term care. And the purple line here is to illustrate that there seems to be quite a strong case for ensuring against this risk people will not face at all and will be catastrophic for some of them. 
And the Dilnot Commission in the UK, for example, tried to take into account this distribution of risk when thinking about a solution for long-term care financing. That's a brief <laughs> to the issue and why we want, we're thinking about collective ways of financing care. And I'm going to just take you a bit through some uh, research on changing demography and epidemiology, just very brief, thinking what are the implications for health and long-term care systems, then quick, quick, a very brief overview of long-term care financing approaches, and finally I'll be discussing how we can look to the future and can we look forward to some innovations in this area. In terms of demography, the this comes from the United Nations population maps, very, very, and they produce these lovely graphs for you if you say which year you want. This is 2020, the percentage of the population aged 65 and over. The green are the color, or almost the blue are the color. The higher the population, the sort of the, dar the darkest countries have about 20 to 30 percent of the population aged 65 or over. The yellow ones, uh, mostly Africa and some Asian countries, and um, in America, you're looking at less than 5%. So if we look at 2050, it's about 30 years ago. This is this light. As you can see, some countries are turning blue, where it means about 30 to 40% of the population aged 65 or over. But you also have that many countries in the Americas, in Asia, and also beginning to happen in Africa, are also experiencing important aging of the population. And that's very important because also the numbers of people who live in these countries are, are very large. And an illustration of this, and, and also linking to the changing epidemiology, are projections of the numbers of people living with dementia. This is from the Alzheimer's, um, the World Alzheimer's Report 2015. I think this is being updated at the moment. But if you look here, 20, well, we're here now pretty much, 2020, already the majority of people living with dementia are living in middle-income countries. But if you look to 2050, the numbers are growing enormously. It doesn't look that like dementia will be sort of very substantial issue in volume for low-income countries for a while yet. But we definitely can expect changes and, and the need to respond to dementia in countries that maybe don't, haven't had to think about aging until now. And uh, this is from the UK, and this is some work we did with colleagues uh, very good colleagues at the uh, University of Newcastle, the epidemiologists, who do forecasting of uh, the care needs of the older population. And what's really interesting about this model, the references down here, is that it takes into account the characteristics and how people who are, are already exist. So we're looking at real people who are now at the middle of their life, and it's looking at risk factors for um, disability, comorbid um, chronic conditions, and dementia, and it's projecting what will happen if current patterns of, of epidemiological trends uh, keep changing. So it's not that we change the trends, but we, what we're just doing is we're taking into account what health behaviors and what health risks people have already today, and we already know which population it is because they're now a bit younger, and we've linked different data sets to be able to project that into the future. So what's really important here is that this is, oh, sorry, I'm going back, I'm going back, yes, is that this is, um, these are the future numbers of people with substantial dependency. This is the population who would be using long-term care. And this is today, so the, uh, sorry, in, in this light color is today, and this darker color is 2035. And what we find here is a population that pretty much has no dementia, and uh, the, what's the largest group at the moment of people with substantial needs is a group that just has, just has either one chronic condition and dependency, but doesn't have dementia, doesn't have multimorbidity. The sort of two diseases comes next, but then uh, so three diseases. But what we find is that this group is becoming uh, smaller over time, in fact, it's becoming very small. And what we're finding is that people are surviving with much more complex needs. So we don't just have this pattern of people who just have some care needs, maybe are bed bound, they need a bit of help with ADLs. What we're finding are people, and um, have a look here, a huge group of people who are not only going to have uh, dependency, but they also have dementia, and they also have two or more chronic conditions to be managed. 
Now, this population is very different than our current population in nursing homes, using care systems, uh, using other uh, long-term care services, and we can't really separate their care needs very well. They're the same people in the same place, and, we, and I think this really means that we need to think what the implications are of this changing population for, long, for health and long-term care systems, because they're both, these people have both needs. So I'm looking, trying to think a bit separately, and this is very broad, I'm not going to go into any, any detail. Uh, so for high-income countries, what we know is that we already have huge problems coordinating the health and long-term care system, and that this is going to be an even more important problem going forward. And uh, that's something we definitely need to address, but we haven't really been very good at finding ways to do it. And the problem is the suitability of the existing health and care models, the way that they are financed, the way that they are incentivized, and also even the center of attention of, attention of the healthcare system is really, really not on this type of people with complex uh, comorbidities and dementia, but on people with much more short-term illnesses. In middle-income countries, what we're finding is that they're experiencing very rapid aging, many countries don't have universal health coverage yet before having uh, fully developed health and care systems. And this actually maybe is an opportunity because they can probably already start thinking about this much more complex population that is be going to be increasing so fast. And uh, also most of the middle income countries, at least the ones that we're doing some research on, there are some exceptions, uh, but most of them don't have a long-term care system as such, but in many of them, there's some long-term care already being provided through community health services. And I'm going to leave that here, but I think that is really important, the fact that they've already built something into their health system, and we need to think very carefully whether what we have done in the high-income countries for historical reasons is still going to work for them, and whether they have perhaps the opportunity to build much more integrated care from the beginning. Um, so, a brief, very quick overview here. I'm just going to go very fast through approaches, main approaches to long-term care financing. I'll look first at how, do, how are we doing it? How are we sharing the risk of long-term care? What's the public sector doing? And what have we learned from high-income countries? And I'll be very fast, I'm sorry about that. Um, so we start with the family. That's the first place where we share the risk. And that's where, when, especially in absence of organized systems, usually what happens is one family member cares for another when they need care. You might have a bit more support around you through your community. It might be that the neighbors look on you. It might be that there's some local community center that you can visit. In some countries, you have private long-term care insurance schemes. But what can really but all of these will only cover some people. And also the amount of risk sharing that you can do is not very big. But if you really want to share the risk for, through the whole population, then the only option really is to go for a public sector involvement, be it through a system that collects taxes and then distributes it to people who need care, or a social insurance system. And um, I've tried to show here, <laughs> with the scale is not very good, but I've tried to show that, that uh, if you really want to share the, the risk through the whole population, the public sector is the only way to go. Um, just a bit more on also how we're doing it at the moment. These are people with, uh, these are a recent estimate of the costs of uh, dementia in the UK and uh, in England, sorry, and you can see that uh, healthcare costs are actually quite small. So we often think of, although dementia is a health condition, the health, the health system doesn't know much what to do with people with dementia. They don't do very much other than diagnosing a bit of medication and a bit of psychiatric support sometimes. The 42% of the costs are unpaid care costs, 42% uh, are social care. Now, England doesn't have a very generous social care system, so of these 42%, only 16% is actually publicly funded. So the total share of public funding for the care of people with dementia in England is 32%. The rest of the costs are shouldered by the family, be it through paying for care, or through for social care, or through unpaid care costs. Oops. So, 
Um, this is just an illustration. There are many others out there, but family, we know that families are the largest source of long-term care resources, and I think that's also the case in more generous countries uh, that, like the Netherlands, Scandinavia. Unpaid family care, though it doesn't have a price, that's why it's unpaid, it does have a cost. The costs are multiple, be it through reduced employment, risk of impoverishment, loss of social protection, because if you give up work, it's not only that you give up your salary, you're also giving up your pension contributions. The costs uh, in terms of care, uh, carers' health, quality of life, and also in some of the developing countries we're looking at, there are also long-term costs for child carers who maybe are, are not following up on education or early career opportunities. And uh, shown that before, the cost of formal care can easily be catastrophic, consuming entire lifetime savings. How does the public sector fund long-term care? As we showed, uh, was that the biggest way of pooling risk. Uh, there's two main systems. One is tax-based, the other are social insurance systems. The tax-based systems can be a variety of approaches from residual minimalistic systems to very generous uh, universal care coverage. So it actually doesn't mean that there is a type of tax-based system. They're, they're really, really very different between them. There's an issue, which is that they're, very, they're more susceptible to cuts than social insurance system because there's, uh, social care has lower political clout. It's a bit, um, and I'll talk more about that. Entitlement in some of systems, not in Spain, which is tax-based, but and has clear entitlements. But in most countries, the people are, may not be aware of what costs they face because they don't have a clear entitlement system. In social insurance system, what happens is that funds are raised specifically for long-term care, and that protects long-term care from at least so, to some extent from political interference. They're usually developed using health social social insurance infrastructure, so what, um, they can be regressive depending how you define, how you define how you collect the income. They depend on narrower sources of funds and taxation usually, but they tend to have very clear rules of entitlement, and usually there's some copayment, but it's very explicit how much that is. And this is a model that seems to be expanding in Asia, following Japan, we'll hear more about it in South Korea. The UK has a cautionary tale. I mean, apart from Brexit, we've got th other things happening in the UK, and one of them is a social care crisis. And uh, we've been trying to, re to reform long-term care for many years. We've had lots of expert commissions. Marcello and I have done lots of work <laughs> in this area, uh, uh, trying to, with other colleagues, trying to provide examples of what would happen if you change different ways of funding long-term care. But we've had no reforms. The way it's funded is uh, it's through block grants to municipalities. And that means that, and these block grants are not earmarked for care. And what happened is we had a recession and most of the cuts in public services fell squarely on social care. And that, and, and that was at the time when demand was growing. And we've had real decreases in, in social care spending in real terms. And um, just to show you that as well as Brexit, we've got other crises going on every day. There's a headline in the paper about the social care crisis and lots of different examples of, of what, how it's affecting people and even recognition that uh, something maybe hasn't gone very well. So what have we learned? We've learned that even in high-income countries, uh, family carers are the main form of long-term care financing through their time, through their savings. Uh, countries tend to choose the same approach to public financing that they have used for healthcare. So if they had the tax-based healthcare system, they tend to do the same for a long-term care. And if also in the US, you also have uh, private insurance for both. In practice, most social insurance systems are also funded by taxation. It's very important not to forget that. Private insurance does not seem to work as a means to cover the entire risk of care, but it can be a useful top-up when you have a universal system that covers a basic care package. And the UK is showing the, the fragility of non earmark uh, block grants to municipalities. Looking to the future, we are working on a new project called Stride in seven middle-income countries funded by the UK Global Challenges Research Fund. And what we're doing is we're taking a fresh approach. We're using dementia because of this mixture of health and care needs that I was illustrating before. And we're using, we're going back to the beginning. So we're using theory of change to understand how stakeholders and people in the system think 
They can deal with dementia. We're using situational analysis to understand the current healthcare social protection systems that they have and the current institutions and areas for growth that they have. And then we're trying to understand through stakeholder in, uh, engagement what are the policy goals for the next 15 years, where do they want to be, and then we'll be using simulation modeling to show how to reach them and understand, and here's where it comes, how that could be financed. And also what are the workforce, organizational implication agendas. We're also trying to get in early and try to think constructively about the policy and research agenda in this area. And the, the website is stride.dementia.org. We're also on Twitter. And uh, stride is in, started in seven middle-income countries, but we have a number, of, we have a new project in Hong Kong, Taiwan probably, uh, a small project in Switzerland, and uh, we've also got a couple, a few countries, Chile, Romania, New Zealand, Vietnam and Korea are also thinking of doing something similar if they get funding. And that's it, I leave that here for, while you ask questions, because that's my last slide. But it's basically a quote from this really good report from the OECD, saying that muddling through is not enough in relation to long-term care, and we need to have a comprehension vision of long-term care. Thank you very much. <laughs> five minutes for questions. Does anybody have a question to start us off? So uh, I have a question. Uh, why, why do you say that uh, social, uh, financing long-term care from social insurance can be regressive while financing it by taxes, uh, it's not necessarily the case. Yeah, so uh, in most of the systems that, that I know of, <laughs> it's usually only income that is taken into account. So people that have a lot of assets, although that's not the same in every country, but usually it's only income. And that means that people with large assets are not paying as much. Uh, so it is more regressive than a taxation system that also includes um, assets, and also many systems also have a ceiling, which means that over a certain level of contribution or of income, you don't pay anymore. And again, that's more regressive than uh, usually general taxation. But of course, taxes also vary. So if you really, if you are uh, uh, financing uh, long-term care out of sin taxes, for example, which some countries in Asia are considering, then that could also be quite a regressive approach. But, yeah, I didn't go into much detail. It's a good question. <laughs> Thanks. Hiding up here, you can't see me. Okay. <laughs> That's Charles Norman from Trinity College, Dublin. I was interested in your point about the potential role of private insurance as a top-up system. The experience I've seen both in Canada and particularly in uh, Slovenia is that those schemes that do additional private funding top-up systems like that have extremely high transaction costs relative to the revenues that are raised there. And if you're looking at it in terms of the actual contribution it makes relative to the burden that it imposes, it really is a very negative experience there. And I just wondered if there was any experience within long-term care funding specifically where it would suggest this isn't just a way of enriching the bureaucrats and the lawyers, although I love them both. I mean... It, if it's private, somebody is going to get enriched along the way, but if it's uh, for profit. Uh, but, uh, so that, that's a given. But uh, in Germany, and in particular in France, uh, there's quite a lot of products being sold. So I was judging this from the demand side. Um, it's not huge. It's not a huge market, but it's at least bigger than any other market in Europe for private long-term care insurance. And this is because in these countries, you have a very clear entitlement, and what people are doing is protection, buying is protection for co-payments. It tends to be quite a cheap product that is sold here, and because it's a top-up and it's a fixed amount that you're insuring for in case you have the need, it's quite cheap to administer, and quite often it is also acquired, I think, especially in France, through employment packages. So you have a, if you're employing a whole, uh, insuring a whole company, it's a lot cheaper than if people buy it individually and have individual risk.
And um, we'll take one more question while our next presenter sets up. But um, go ahead. I was wondering whether um, the insurance schemes and the public financing, whether it be progressive or regressive, is out of time. And should we not look at it more radically by imposing savings accounts per person as the age of 18 on? And then you have also quite a risk, sh well, you would have a risk pooling and a risk sharing that could potentially solve the uh, issues you're presenting. Have you given so that any consideration? Are you saying risk, uh, so saving schemes with risk sharing or with, I mean, a saving schemes with risk sharing is essentially so, some sort of social insurance, I would argue. Uh, no? <laughs> uh, it could be private. The thing is that social insurance is private in many countries. Uh, it's, it's, delivered, it's, it's delivered privately. Uh, it's just that it's, there's a, a national system of regulating it that, uh, that, so that you can equalize, really share the risk across the population. I know in some countries in Singapore they're experiencing with a mixture uh, and uh, what, what they have is a private system where people are pre-enrolled and then they can opt out. I didn't go into much detail because there isn't much time, but there's an issue of the people who are being left out and in terms of equity, it may not perform as well. But it's, uh, Singapore is also very different than, than many other countries. But it's an interesting approach. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we may get back to some of these issues in our cross-cutting discussion. So. Is it on? Yes. Well, good morning. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Be before I begin the, my presentation, I would like to emphasize one point is that in normal situations, policymakers do not have an option of nationally deciding which is better. The, it's the Decisions are already made in the past, in the, in the historical legacy of each country. And this is particularly important in the case of Japan, which implemented public long-term care insurance in 2000. So uh, I would like to begin with the historical background, because that the history has determined the present and will determine the future. The historical background was that the uh, the social services really began in 1963 with the Elders Welfare Act, and this was expanded to expanded services to all elders, but still was focused on the poor. And this led to the introduction of nursing homes and home helpers. Uh, before then, it was, uh, except for the very destitute, uh, it was left for the family to provide care. Now, this Welfare Act was greatly expanded in 1989 to increase, uh, called the Gold Plan, to increase services for the elders. And it was a political issue was for the government party to win back the seats it had lost after introducing a consumption tax. So it was a very political move, but it turned out to be very popular with the public. And the original five-year plan was became a 10-year plan. And one, one example was that the number of daycare centers increased tenfold from 1,615 to over 17,000. Now, uh, the health services uh, made a de facto expansion of long-term care when the 50% coinsurance, that is the patients paid 50% of all charges, this was moved was uh, moved to zero percent co insurance in 1973. So this made the hospitals very accessible, and these hospitals became de facto nursing homes. For example, the number of inpatients 65 and over doubled from 1.8 million to 4 million in 20 years. So. The situation before we implement the long-term care insurance, uh, public social insurance in 2000, was that long-term care services had already expanded, but problems with social services 
Uh, there was geographical disparity as decision lay with the mayor. It, although it was a block grant uh, by the central government, the decision whether to expand or not lay with the mayor. So as each mayor made his or her decision, uh, there was a great disparity between the amount of so among the social services that were available in that municipality. The other problem was that the services, uh, if someone wanted to get social services, uh, the decision whether to get the service or the amount of services was decided by the rogue government staff in charge. Uh, he or she could say, you can get this or you can get that, and that was the final decision. And it was focused on the poor and those without family support because it was a social service uh, issue. And uh, on the other hand, there was problems with health services because it was costly and inappropriate care in hospital settings because uh, the fact that the uh, co-insurance was waived for elders uh, meant that uh, the hospital became a very convenient place to hospitalize those who needed care by the families. It was costly because the hospital, because it was hospital, it required hospital staffing levels per, uh, of physicians and nurses uh, in, in in lieu of care workers who do not necessarily need these professional qualifications. It was also inappropriate because it was focusing on treating diseases. The, the hospitals were paid by medication, by doing lab tests and so forth. So, so uh, there was not enough adequately cared for the actual process of care. So, for these reasons, uh, the inappropriate care provided by the social services and the inappropriate care provided by the health services that led to the long-term care insurance in two, the year 2000. And this led to a transfer of existing social health services to long-term care insurance. Um, it was half handed by long-term care insurance premiums, uh, and these premiums were levied on all those 40 and above. The reason why it was 40 and above was that uh, if they are in their 40s, their parents would be uh, may be at risk of long-term care insurance, so they should be prepared to pay. It was a compromise. And, and half by taxes, by national and local taxes. The, those eligible were 65 and over, and those 40 and 64 with age-related disabilities, such as stroke or Alzheimer's. O only service benefits and no cash benefits. And these benefits were set by the eligibility level of the individuals. They were assessed and then into the six and later seven levels of benefits. And they were given essentially vouchers which, of, which were worth about $450 to $3,200 per month. Now, with these vouchers, uh, they, they could go to any provider, uh, the licensed provider in Japan, and the providers were paid on a fee-for-service system. So, so much for a, a, a visit by a home, home, home helper, or so much for adult daycare per day, and so forth. So there was a fee schedule for long-term care insurance. And this long-term care insurance fee schedules applied uh, to both the private and the public providers. Uh, this read to the uh, creation of a huge new long-term care in insurance service market because uh, now these people have vouchers, uh, de facto vouchers to buy these long-term care insurance and they could go to the provider of their choice. So this led to the uh, ex huge expansion of the private sector providers of which I will uh, explain later. 
So the, third, uh, so the reason why I stress the historical context was that policies are not made in vacuum. Uh, the services that were transferred to the long-term care insurance, the ins institutional care was that nursing homes were, were transferred and health services were another type of intermediate care nursing, quasi-nursing home facilities. And also half of the long-term care hospital beds. You, you, I, I emphasize that many hospitals became de facto long-term care institutions. And these hospitals, half of them were transferred to long-term care insurance. For community care, uh, home helpers, daycare, respite care, wheelchairs, that is the loan of wheelchairs and so forth, home renovation to put in lamps, and et cetera. And from health services, visiting nurse services, rehab staff, rehab daycare, and despite care. Now, these services were formally transferred and were financed by the long-term care insurance, but <coughs> excuse me, these services were not integrated. And this uh, handing over of of de facto vouchers to buy long-term care insurance. And as long as the providers were paid, they, they could expand. And so you see the enormous expansion in long-term care insurance. The 65 plus population did increase 1.6 times. And the uh, current uh, population, 65 and over in Japan, is 28% of the population. But, so it has increased, but only by 1.6 times. But the number of certified eligible increased, uh, tripled, and the number of service users increased by 3.2 times. But the uh, ma ma greater increase was the lighter eligibility levels because they had not been receiving services before the implementation of the long-term care insurance. The average premium, uh, as a result, doubled from about $27 uh, average to $54. And the long-term care expenditures uh, tripled, reflecting the number of service users from uh, 33 billion to 96 billion. And this was due to the fact that the uh, premiums were for the elders 65 and over were, were capped. And the future prospects are even more uh, alarming from the fiscal point of view, because we, the per capita expenditures by age groups, uh, for health insurance and uh, Long, oh, sorry. Oh. Oh. This is the point. Oh. Oh. You see that, uh, uh, well, Per capita expenditures for health do increase with age, but those 65 to 69 are only uh, compared with 85 to 89. It is only 2.2 times. But if we look at long-term care insurance, it is uh, 23 times. So we hear about the tsunami of aging, but it is not just the increase of the population 65 and over, it is the aging within the age population. The population that are using long-term care services the most are the 90 and over. And that is the age group when we're going to see the greatest increase in population. So even if the growth of the elderly population caps out, uh, the long-term care expenditures will continue to increase. So uh, the number of users and ratio for profits, uh, for home help, home help users, the, those who come uh, to do uh, provide care uh, for uh, 
body touch care, such as taking a bath and for cook, cooking meals, etc. These increased 1.6 times, but the percentage delivered by for profits doubled. The daycare users also increased by 1.7 times, but the percent of for profits increased tenfold from 4.5% to 44.9%. Uh, so you, you see that the giving of the de facto vouchers increase the use of for profits. Uh, but this was not the case for institutional care users. But this institutional care is the classic type that, uh, that were being used before the long term care insurance. And these institutional care was the pro for profits were not allowed into this type of institutional care. So what happened? The, 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 because there was the, uh, the traditional institutional care was close to for profits, the, uh, the, the introduction of new types of services, despite the increase in institutional care beds, the waiting list for nursing homes lengthened because the care burden of the family, although mitigated, was not absorbed by the provision of home and community care services. Burden was especially high for those with Alzheimer's. So to meet the excess demand, private nursing homes, special housing for elders, increased very rapidly. And because with this special housing for elders, the care costs were paid by the long-term care insurance, but the, uh, inst the bed and board costs were privately borne. And in the tr traditional institutional care, they came to be privately paid also, but the costs were lower. So you see that the... Uh, Uh, the uh, these special housing uh, had only this percentage. But now they, the new type is now most of the uh, is nearly the same number of beds as in the designated facility. So uh, since then, there have been efforts to contain costs. It's difficult to decrease fees in the long-term care insurance fee schedule. It was decreased slightly in 2003 and 2006, but not since then, because care workers' wages cannot be lowered because of the chronic shortages. Uh, there are very few immigrant workers allowed in Japan. Uh, the increase, the increase hotel, hotel costs for users in institutional care uh, from 2005, residents must pay the full cost of bed and board, but waive, this had to be waived for those with low income, which turned out to be 40% of the total. The increased coinsurance for those with high income rate increased from 10 to, to 20% and again to 30% in 2018, but 90% plus still pay only 10% coinsurance because their income is low. So, so in conclusion, uh, long-term care services have, had already been increased prior to the implementation of long-term care insurance because politicians realized their popularity with voters. It was a very popular way for politicians to get votes. After long-term care insurance implementation, the number of users tripled. For-profit company providers increased their share. The excess demand for institutional care has been met by new types of so-called housing. They were essentially the same, but under the government uh, classification, they were termed as housing. 
and uh, if you make the services, the care services, part of the benefits, it's the distinction between institutional care and, and uh, community care is very hard to draw the line. The, the cost sharing, and finally, cost sharing is difficult in long-term care insurance because elders tend to have low incomes. So, uh, so, so you, you, you can try to cost share, but they just don't have the ability uh, unless you take assets into consideration. But we have, in Japan, have not crossed the line about assets. So with that, I end my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Um, thank you for the excellent presentation. We're young from King's College London. Um, Japan's experience is very, very interesting and relevant uh, in terms of long-term care insurance as a financing mechanism. Um, and China in particular uh, uh, is, is um, piloting um, the long-term care insurance in a few cities. Um, but I'm just wondering um, for Japan, from, from Japan's experience, because the long-term care insurance has been existing for almost 18 years, is sustainability going to, a, going to be a problem in the future for Japan, given the population aging um, is becoming uh, a challenge for the country? Because you, you said lots of um, you know, things about long-term care insurance, but you haven't really mentioned whether this insurance is going to be sustainable. Um, in the future, and has any analysis done or any projection done, um, in particular for Japan's case? Well, um, of course there has been projections, but uh, long-term care insurance uh, is more difficult to contain expenditures in long-term care than in health insurance, because in health insurance you, you can say you can try to make it more efficient. You can cut doctor's salary, or you can cut down pharmaceutical prices, but there's no leeway to cut costs in long-term care because most of it is personnel costs. And personnel costs, uh, they are not paid high wages, the care workers. So th therefore, uh, it, it seems inevitable, inevitable that costs are going to increase. And although projections have been made by the government, uh, since it's so popular and has become part of life, uh, co co containing costs in long-term care insurance is a much more difficult proposition for policymakers and politicians. So, so therefore, we, we are more or less stuck with the system. Thank you, Charles Norman again. The question I was wanting to ask a little was, if you look at this in absolute terms rather than in percentage increases, in most countries, even though the proportionate increases in long-term care expenditure are very high, the absolute amounts remain relatively low um, because long-term care costs tend to be relatively small relative to health care costs. And I just wonder if you look at this combining health and long-term care and look at it in absolute increases as opposed to proportionate increases, does that make it look more sustainable in the long run? Well, it depends on where, which side you look at it. Uh, when long-term care insurance started in 2000, long-term care expenditure, insurance expenditures was one-tenth of health expenditure. N now it, it is one-fifth. So, so uh, I'm sp still talking relatively because it's difficult to really judge huge numbers. But uh, so, so the, uh, the rate of increase is 50% higher than healthcare expenditures. So for for my uh, de demographic, ex mostly from demographic, ex because there's very little increase due to uh, innovation or decreases due to innovation, unlike in healthcare. 
So it's labor cost driven. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the presentation. I was wondering, the system in Japan is uh, kind of similar to the one that we have in Spain. Although in Spain we don't, um, we don't have, um, it's a bit different. So individuals have to pay a copayment, but uh, it's subsidized by the government. And I was wondering whether in Japan, uh, because the problem is that people don't have the money to, to buy this insurance, whether they, there are some subsidies to help people to, to encourage them to take up the private insurance. It is not a question of whether they can buy or not. It's compulsory. That's why it's called a social insurance. Those who are age of over 40 must enroll. There's no choice. And the, the, uh, the amount of premiums they pay are proportional to their income. So everyone should be able to afford it. I think it's my time now. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, and we will proceed with our last presenter, and then we'll have time for a group discussion. Right. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Uh, so th thanks a lot, Sally, for chairing this session. Thanks to the IHEA organizer for this wonderful um, um, conference, and thanks to all of you coming here today. So what I'm going to do today is to talk about our bit of research on the market functionings in the care home market functionings. And I, I'm going to make a special case, it's an empirical work for the English um, care home market. Uh, I'm Marcello Morciano, so I'm a member of the HOPE Research Group, Health Organization, Policy and Economics at Manchester University. And this project is a joint um, work with colleagues that are listed here and financially supported by CRC. So I decided to organize my presentation into four um, main bits. So I'm going to start with uh, try to provide the rationale why the, uh, focusing on the care home industry is important. Then I'm going to provide an overview of the care um, in, on the English local um, markets. Then I'm going to discuss a bit of the making, uh, try to make a causal inference from these markets. And then I try to um, draw some conclusion and policy um, implications. So why this uh, uh, market is important? As uh, Adelina um, suggested before, um, long-term care services may be provided in different forms. So we can move from a situation where most of the care is provided informally, infrequently, by some uh, non-professional helpers, to a situation where care is provided by specialized person in a specialized setting. What I'm going to discuss today is basically services that are provided in a uh, um, care home setting, so in a specialized setting. So there are two types of care homes, residential care homes and nursing care homes. The latter are more specialized in providing nursing services. Um, why is it important to focus on, 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 on that uh, sector? Because there is a large and growing sector, not only for the demographic and epidemiological pressures that many countries experience, not only developed countries, but it's also a crucial sector and why I say that? Because most of the decision to enter in a care home is a very stressful decision, not only for the person, the vulnerable person, or the parent, or the relatives. Um, there is also policy concern, because most of the attention from policymakers is to try to improve quality of care homes um, services in the idea of reducing avoidable hospi hospitalization from this segment of the population that is high likely uh, to use hospital services. But also the idea that if you increase supply of care home beds, it might reduce as well delayed um, hospital discharge. And this is a big issue also for, for England and for many other countries. So not surprising, the performance of this industry is uh, high, very high in the policy um, agenda. So there has, there has been a huge um, literature on that. Um, so in these slides, I'm not covering, you know, this is not a comprehensive coverage of the, all the literature. Most of the literature, I should say, is focused on the US. 
and there is a very little of other countries. So if any one of you knows a little bit more on any experience, any work um, in other countries, please let me know. But what I'm going to do today is to try to do my little role in doing a research for the Eng English um, care home markets. So I stress that this is a quite important market for uh, some reasons. So it's dominated by for-profit facilities. So about 80% of the about 12,000 care homes that provide services to older people and people with dementia in England are for-profit. Only 20% is uh, um, run by uh, publicly, uh, publicly run or run by charities. Most of those care homes are, may f face excess of demand, and from an economic point of view, they have a little incentives to improve quality or to reduce um, uh, prices to remain competitive in that market. Now, as in Japan, in England has experienced a significant penetration of large corporate providers, and this is an important point, uh, at least from my personal point of view, because if you try to measure competition, you may think that two care homes that, provide, uh, that belongs to the same provider may not, not, do not compete as a two independent care homes. On the other words, you know, they may use a multi-plan strategy for maximizing the joint profit of the chain, of the uh, big uh, providers. In England, public intervention is manifested in um, um, these three ways, very similar with other countries, so in regulated supply, at least in the US, monitoring and publicly reporting provider qualities, so this because uh, um, 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 to guarantee a minimum um, quality, but also to limit the asymmetry of information, that is a big problem in this market but also in negotiating public supported user fees. So Adelina mentioned the social, crisis, um, social care crisis that we, we have in England. Um, so there is a means test um, system. About 50% of residents in a queer home setting uh, receive some form of support by public support. Public support is provided by local authority in England. There are 152 local authorities. So 50% receive support from local authority, but they need to copay as well, and 50% are self-funded. This means that in many cases, a local authority may have a monopsonistic power that may influence you know, prices and, and, and quality. What I think it differs from the rest of the country the case of England is that one. So basically in 2014, they passed a law, the Care Act, where each local authority received an extra duty. So this duty is to shape the market, the local market. What does it mean is unclear, at least to me. They say that they have to promote efficient and effective um, operation of the market, um, ensure sustainability of the market, that is a big issue as well, and try to foster a continuous improvement in terms of quality. What is, was uh, um, more clear is what the Competition and Marketing Authority in 2017 suggested. And that suggested that an effective procurement strategy should encourage competition amongst the care homes. Why this is um, um, easy to say is very we found that it's very difficult to implement, to operationalize. So we started this journey in um, um, uh, measuring market concentration in England. What we found is that in line with official report that uh, care home markets in England, the local care home markets in England are not concentrated if you make two big assumptions. The first one is that you have to treat each care homes as separate entities, so you completely disregard this idea, this, uh, um, the chain memberships, that two or more care homes belong to the same chain, the same uh, providers. And more important as well is that you have to assume that residential and nursing care home compete in the same market. Now, I think that this is a very important assumption because if you need an, a nursing bed, you, as, a, as a patient, you may not be interested that near to you there is a residential care homes. Okay? So we make the case that we should separate these two markets to, uh, to, to consider these as two separate sub-markets. So what's the effect of, doing, of relaxing these two assumptions? So first of all, here I focus on the nursing care home market. Oh, whoa. Here I focus on the nursing care home markets. As you can see,
By measuring concentration at individual level or chain level doesn't change anything only for 10 local authorities out of 152. For the rest of them, level of concentration increase. So if you use a measure of concentration that consider each care homes as an individual entity, you find that about 25% of the care homes uh, of the markets of the local authorities exceed the um, threshold, the official threshold to be considered a market concentrated. But when you measure level of concentration at chain level, you find that about 50% of the markets uh, or 50% of the local authority face a market that is highly concentrated. And about, about a quarter of those markets are extremely concentrated. Okay? And as you may um, think, um, these, uh, the chain penetration does not occur uh, randomly in the, in, the, in, the, in, the in the region with some, um, with some areas more prone to um, chain penetration than others. Then, now, you know, this, this is a kind of descriptive statistics that I show you is important to monitor a level of concentration, but from a policy point of view, what is more important is to assess to what, to what extent the concentration is related to some market outcomes, thinking about prices. Now, in terms of prices, you have the price that the privately funded uh, um, users pay and the, the price that the local authority pays. We, we will focus on the form, on the latter and in this analysis. But also, you know, some other outcomes can be um, the uh, quality and also supply, you know, number of beds relative to demand in that market. So, in order to answer to that question, you have to address the causality issue. So whether there is a causal uh, relation between level of competition and market outcomes. Our approach to that is to recognize that this market is extremely complex. Okay? As I said, there are different suppliers for profit and non-for-profit that may have a completely different um, objective function to maximize. There, is a, there are local authorities that may use a different commission policies. There is a mix of uh, self-funding and publicly supported residents that may face to different prices as well. There are, we should consider also the home care alternatives um, there. And then, more crucially as well, we, we have to take into account also that local market conditions may af affect um, market outcomes. Okay? Now, if you leave a moment the static analysis and you focus on the, the dynamics, you may find that this endogeneity uh, problem is even more severe. Um, so even if you're doing a dynamic analysis, you, 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 you may encounter this problem of um, interpreting your results in a causal um, way. As a researcher, we do not observe full workings of the market, even in the aggregate level. We have limited scope for experiments, and then, you know, difficulties in finding valid, valid and relevant um, instruments for using an instrumental variable approach in order to break down this endogeneity. So what we sh should we do in, in a situation like that? But our point is also this one. What a causal impact of concentration on price, quality, and supply, and so on mean in this context? And we found that basically, um, you know, if you consider it theoretically, all those outcomes are jointly determined. So there is no unambiguous an, an sense in which you can say that concentration causes some of those outcomes. Okay? So in this paper, instead of asking the, the, the research question, what is the causal impact of market concentration on market outcomes, we break down this uh, question into two bits. So the first one is... Uh, a more simple question is which local characteristics makes a local authority more um, um, prone to high or low um, uh, uh, market concentration. Okay? And then we use the results of this um, uh, question to try to infer on what are the implications of this, like, uh, this uh, vulnerability to high and low level of concentration on price that the local authority pay, quality, and supply. Okay? 
Now, I'm going to skip this um, slide, but happy to come back later. What I, I, I just say, uh, would like to stress that here we make use of simple reduced form regressions in answering the, the first question. And then in answering the second question, we, use, we make an intelligent use of some of the prediction that you can get in order to provide some um, um, messages that may be relevant for uh, the local authorities here. Okay? But happy to come back. So what are the results that we get? So in terms of answering the first question, what are the exogenous area characteristics that are more um, um, related to high, to uh, observe, observing high or low level of concentration, we found that local authority that experience high market concentrations are those that uh, have a low potential demands, and this is, um, quite clear why. So basically our interpretation of that is that uh, um, there are markets where they have, they, they have a few homes, care homes overall, and, and this, this structure makes the, it easier for a care homes to uh, scale the market, so to monopolize the, the market. Okay? We found also that high market concentration is related to high percentage of low income um, uh, people, for, uh, for older people. Now, as, uh, as I mentioned before, um, the social care system in England is heavily means test. This means that in local authority where there is a huge uh, a percentage of poor uh, older people, the, 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 the intervention of the local authority is higher in uh, financing and uh, commissioning um, care on beds for uh, those poor people. This means that basically a care homes needs a greater needs um, to monopolize uh, the market just in order to withstand the monopsonic um, power that the local authority may have. Okay? Then also we found that high market concentration is related to high economic development of opportunity in that area. Now, this is a result that is um, uh, quite interesting, but we found that basically the stronger are those opportunities, the lower is the potential flow of new incumbents, you know, new competitors in the market, and this uh, is associated with high equilibrium market concentration that we observe in that area. Okay, and then as you may think, um, um, uh, high level, high market concentration is, uh, market concentration is high in area where there is a high um, house price. This is basically a proxy of the high estate cost component, so the fixed um, uh, cost that an incumbent or the current supplier should face in order to run this business. Okay. In order to answer to our second question, we found that those local authorities that have a high tendency towards market concentration, we found that the price that the local authority pays are generally higher. In terms of quality, we don't find uh, um, strong evidence. So quality is slightly higher, but in many cases not statistically significant, even when we bootstrap. What we found, and is relatively new because most of the analysis neglects you know, the effect of competition on supply, we found a much larger response on, of supply of care on beds. That is significantly lower in, um, in markets that are highly concentrated. Okay? And those results are robust to deviation to our baseline model, so considering heteroscedasticity and non-normality. Okay? So, these, uh, to sum up, allow us uh, to make two big um, you know, conclusions that are basically uh, some um, um, results that I would like you to bring uh, with you at home. So the first one is that when you try to measure competition in this market, if you do not consider the chain structure and the fact that this market is basically formed by two different separate supermarkets, you may end up with a severe underestimation of the level of concentration in that market. Okay, and there is considerable variation in market concentration that is due to local area characteristics. So there are characteristics that basically the local authority cannot modify. So there is a you know a frictional level of concentration that the local authority should face. Then the second one is more a question for for you. Is basically a situation where we think that we can make a more intelligent use of, of reduced form equation in order to answer to some of the 
of, of, of the questions that are important from a policy uh, viewpoint. And what we think is that making inference with instrumental variable in this particular market may incur, you may incur in the risk of missing a full appreciation of the dynamics and the general equilibrium in this market. If you allow for a more descriptive approach as the one that uh, um, we use, we f what we found is that the local authority seems to have market power to resist the price rises and to contain in all the um, uh, cuts in fundings that the social care system in England has experienced over the year. But what is clear is that local authority has no power in, uh, to resist the withdrawal of supply. And this is uh, something that we, f we see quite clearly every day in, 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 in England. And then there is a likely to be a considerable variation across the local authority in the challenge that they face in order to um, access the duty of market shaping that is provided by the 2014 Care Act. So I'm going to stop here at the moment and uh, happy to get, to get your comments and feedbacks. Thanks a lot. A few minutes of questions on this paper, and then we'll form a panel. Uh, so any questions? Ah, excellent. Hi, thanks for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, I would like to know if you test the factor of uh, health care supply, because I think if we be come back to the first presentation, the boundary be, uh, between health care and long-term care is not uh, it's very, it's very uh, small. And um, I would like to know if uh, the, the supply factor, uh, health care supply factor have an impact on, uh, on your results, on our that is a very interesting question. It's very difficult to <laughs> provide a comprehensive answer to that. So basically, the, the question is uh, whether there is any kind of... Sub I, I mean, I can rephrase the question in which kind of complementarity or, sustainability or, or substitution effect you may find between healthcare. So putting more money into the healthcare system or um, you know, in the uh, social care system. Um, and from a policy point of view, this is important because basically you can have some spillover effect between the two, in the sense that if you have a situation, a local market where there is uh, only few care homes that they face excess of demand, this means that basically lots of older people or people with dementia may be blocked into, into the a hospital. So this means basically that you, are, you have you know, some kind of delayed discharge from the hospital. Okay, of situation that could be treated in a uh, better way or can be treated more in general in a care home setting. So this is one, one way of thinking of. The other way of thinking of is that when the supply, the quality of the care home services provided in an area are higher, are, are good, you may have a reduction in the type of avoidable hospital emissions that you can get from people that live in a care homes. This is a very important issue because uh, some estimate, official estimates in England, they say that um, a, a person, conditional on other characteristics, a person that lives in a care home setting experiences a 50% more chance to get an avoidable hospital admissions in a certain point in, in, a, in a year. This means that better quality or better prevention or better um, you know, facilities may reduce as well you know, this kind of threat on the um, hospital um, use. And there were some experiments in, um, in, in England, just to cite the Vanguard initiative and so on, in which they try to Im improve the level of coordination between the health and the social care system by, for example, pulling the budget together, try to find some way in which the, you know, the support can be coordinated between the, the two. And they found that most of the effects 
of the effect in terms of reduction of hospital use comes from experiments that may focus on care homes. Yeah? Uh, thank you. Any more uh, questions on this presentation? Okay, then um, I think what I'm going to do is ask the three presenters to form a panel. And um, anybody have a question to start? Because otherwise I do have one that I can help them kick off with. But if anybody's got a question, I'd like to prioritize questions from the audience. All right. So um, I want to thank you all. I thought those were all fascinating and really interesting and highly relevant presentations. So we've had consideration of the best way to finance care, um, especially uh, given the expected growth and for middle income countries. We've looked at the impact uh, of uh, expanding coverage on expenditures in Japan and then considerations about market supply. Uh, especially the role of local factors in terms of affecting concentration and then subsequently effects on prices, quality, or supply. Now, <clears throat> what struck me as a possibly overarching question is this issue of what's happening to the aging population. And I'm thinking in particular about either the um, expansion or contraction of morbidity during the aging process. Um, and it, uh, I think we can, it might be interesting to consider both expansion or contraction, or you might want to think about what perhaps has been going on in the country or countries that you're looking at during the period of study, as well as anything that might happen in the future. Um, I'd love to hear briefly from all three of you on that, but uh, I don't care what order, so um, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Got my, so we'll, um, can, uh, We've got a few minutes to start, and then we'll uh, go back to questions from the audience. I'm happy to start from the work I presented. Uh, it's very recent from England using the Paxi model, which is, uh, as I mentioned, developed with these colleagues in Newcastle and based on some very good studies. What, what we found is that in England, uh, that what we are finding is that we can expect a compression of morbidity for men, but not for women. Uh, so everybody is living longer, and uh, the, the percentage of that time that will be lived in good health for men is bigger, for women is smaller, so women will be effectively spending more time in ill health and, and, and with dependency as well. And um, it's very interesting because <laughs> also more women are living uh, longer, and uh, that, that's what we have found. It is true that we are finding that, for example, dementia seems to be starting at later, sta at later ages, but people are also living longer. And, and what it tends to mean is that they live longer with conditions like dementia. And that our risk reduction efforts are quite often affecting both the length of life and the amount of time that you can survive with the conditions that you have. So we have some grounds for optimism because delaying the start is very good, but the numbers of year lived doesn't look like, except for men, <laughs> for women at least, uh, it's not something that we can ignore. And uh, whatever happens anyway, the number of people who are going to be live, living longer is so much bigger. That, that and the, the, so the, the uh, population aging is so big that even if we manage to achieve some compression of morbidity for some people, we still have to plan for much larger numbers of people needing care in the future. The uh, findings are essentially the same for Japan as well was uh, described in England. Uh, there have been efforts to, to uh, pre prevent the effort preventive measures for dementia, such as uh, exercise, community activities, and uh, so forth. But, uh, of course, it's very difficult to con conduct a RCT on these uh, community efforts because these are community efforts, so they are specific for the community in which these efforts are being made. Uh, but, but the government has been promoting these community support activities as a way to at least delay and, and uh, 
uh, at least lower the incidence that would be predicted from the demographic factors. Yeah, um, so I fully agree with what already um, said. I mean, the link between um, life expectancy and disability is uh, difficult to at least to describe conceptually, but also to estimate empirically. What, what I can add to the discussion uh, um, that has been, uh, um, or the points that has been already raised, is that in one paper that uh, we did uh, looking at trends in uh, functional difficulties in the United Kingdom, what we found is that there was an increasing trend um, uh, that differs in terms of gender, so there is a gender bias, but most importantly in terms of socioeconomic status. What does it mean for the states, this uh, is a quite alarming uh, situation. So what we found is was a kind of compression of disability, of improving you know, um, um, uh, functional difficulties for those that are better off, and an increasing um, um, uh, severity of functional difficulties amongst the poorest segment of the population. I mean, it can be attributable by different causes, you know, obesity and cardiovascular disease and so on. But this is quite alarming for the states because if you think of a, a, a system that is means tested, this means, you know, for the threat for the future. But even if you think a tax-based system or a social insurance-based, you have to think some form of redistribution so that uh, and now you know, the states will address that. Um, if, if I might make one observation, because we had two presentations from England, and, <laughs> and so I'd like to highlight the difference between a social insurance system in, in Japan compared with the English system. And the main difference, uh, two main differences is that uh, the competition in England is among who is get, going to get the purchasing from the local authorities. In Japan, it is the individual user of long-term care insurance. And so it is an individualized market. And second, because of that fact, this means that the distinction between institutional care and community care has burst, is rapidly disappearing because with uh, specialized housing, the, the same corporation that is, uh, has developed the housing part will also, through its partnership with another company, provide the full service and the full service that is quite extensive in, in community settings is virtually the same as, as an institutional care. So, so the distinctions are disappearing. Now that the bed and board hotel costs are, have to be paid by the individuals. So, so I think we, we should not try to <coughs> sectorize our thinking into institutional care and community care once it, it has become an individual entitlement and a social insurance system, as is the case in Japan. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Excellent point. Any? Uh, oh, here's my. Morning. I'm Warwan Chandrawit from Konkan University, Thailand. Uh, many of the high-income countries have long-term care insurance system. Uh, I'd like to hear from you about the general view for low, for middle and low-income country. Right uh, in Thailand, we also. Uh, facing aging population. And I think many of the middle-income countries also is facing the same uh, situation. Uh, in your point of view, uh, or more general view, do, do you think that uh, middle-income countries should have uh, long-term care insurance? Why or why not? So if I start, so I mean, my understanding is that in Thailand, you finance health, health through taxes. Is that right? And yeah, yeah. So I mean, my, so from the from what we've learned from the high income countries is that once you have an administrative structure that works well at raising revenue, 
uh, it's very good to make sure that your long-term care system is aligned to it. It will be very costly for a country that has no social insurance system to create for, for example, for health, to create one just for long-term care. So that, that wouldn't be something I think anybody would advise. Uh, and uh, what's, um, and as I said, I don't know Thailand very well. I just have some understanding that you have already got a network of long-term care through community nursing. And, and there's already some level of coverage, and that seems to be working reasonably well within the healthcare system structure. So I think it's more of a question of whether you need to create something separate or whether you can expand your coverage of healthcare to accommodate more of the longer term tasks. And then, for example, building in some support for carers, some advice, some training of family carers, and then that way build up the system. But um, I think what's, what I would say is that there isn't a one-size-fits-all for anything. And we know this hasn't happened in the high-income world. Every country is different. And I th think it's extremely important to spend some time thinking very carefully what is the current structure of healthcare system, social protection that you have already, and how are currently the needs of older people with care needs being met? And then, and then are, what are the opportunities within your system to expand to meet these additional needs that are developing? And I think you need a really good dialogue between different parts of the, different parts of the government involved and the different types of providers to, to come up with the best tie or the best uh, program for your country. Yes. Um. Uh, I think the uh, the main problem we had in Japan was long-term care services coming in through the back door. Uh, once it has entered, th then it became an entitlement, a right for those who are receiving the care. So uh, this uh, this was because we had uh, mainly a private sector-driven health service system, which is not the case for Thailand. But under the universal coverage scheme in Thailand. If one community decided to provide these kinds of services as part of their long-term care program, then that would become the standard. And all, all everywhere in Thailand, they would try to reach that standard. So once something has become wide, extensively available in one, mini, one community, then that standard can never be lowered. Others must, others would try to achieve that level. So uh, when funding schemes under UC be very selective in funding long-term care projects, because once it's funded, there's no re road of return. Yeah. It must always expand. Yeah. Um, I fully agree with what you said. I think that we need, you know, we need a good, uh, and comprehensive dialogue um, on that. There is a, a policy issue that, so basically is, um, you know, in order to answer your specific question, whether you should creating or improving a long-term care um, system in your country, well, is, a, is basically a policy issue, my personal point of view. It depends whether the politician and the audience is able and, and willing to devote a part of their budgets and their efforts in order to, to create that. I would argue that Yes, needs to, the earlier the better. But there are some further complexity, I think, for a low and middle income country. And one of that is the level of migrations. So if you think, you know, most developed country has a social care workforce that is made by migrants, mainly comes from, you know, low and middle income country. What does it mean it, that, you know, this, and if you believe it to the healthy migration um, hypothesis, so healthy people move from the, hosting, to, from the native country to the hosting country, you may find, find that, that, you know, this migration pattern will um, help support your, or containing the cost in your country, in your developing country, but will create a problem in the native country, because this means less informal care, informal care to be provided to the older parents that become older and older. Then the, my question again is how you finance a long-term care system in such a condition? Because you know, there are lots of redistributive issues to consider as well. Um, please join me in thanking our panel, uh, well, pres presenters and panel. For
Ex-Präsident.